Sorry, hopefully you're out there. <laughs> um, Wanted to first of all say hello and welcome to our first virtual session this year of our Ask a Master Gardener. Um, my name is Pat and I am today's moderator and then a graduate of the Master Gardener class of 2005. Uh, we're so happy you could join us today and we look forward to our team helping you with any of your gardening questions. Um, unfortunately, it looks like uh, since it's a beautiful day today, but we may be looking to another challenging year as far as our reduced winter rains. But the way I look at it, it gives us the opportunity to learn to garden smarter and more efficiently. Uh, we as master gardeners are available to help you do this and help you also figure out whatever problems you may have be having. So first of all, today, uh, we'll go over our ground rules. Uh, we are asking that you mute your audio and turn off your video. And where you usually can find these controls are either in the lower left-hand corner of your screen or the upper right-hand corner. It depends on the device that you're using. Uh, we ask that if you have a question, to please use the chat box and just type in your question. Uh, some of the questions we have today were already submitted by people that uh, submitted questions when they registered. So we're going to address those questions first, and then we'll take a look, move on to those that are in the chat box. Also, today's session will be recorded. So if there's any, you have any concern with that, yeah, you might want to leave and watch the recording later when it's posted on the YouTube under the Sonoma County Master Gardeners. Um, and I will say there may be occasion today if we need clarification on one of your questions, we may ask you to unmute yourself to clarify and then mute yourself again. Um, okay. The uh, Sonoma Master Gardener Organization has been serving home gardeners in Sonoma County for almost 40 years now. Uh, we are an organization of over 240 volunteers who have been trained by the University of California, Davis. Our mission is to use the most current unbiased research-based information to help the, uh, the home gardener okay. find the answers to issues as diverse as creating an edible food garden, choosing plants and pesticides safely, and preparing your home to be fire resistant. Uh, we are trained by the University of California, Davis. And we ask that, um, and we'll address this later, but please visit our website so you can learn about what we do and there's a wealth of information out there. Okay, in today's Zoom meeting, you'll be seeing myself, the moderator, and today's panelists who are responding to your questions. Behind the scenes, we also have a team of master gardeners doing real-time research to facilitate answering questions, a host that'll be managing the slides and on-screen presentation, and a gatekeeper to ensure uh, access and manage attendance. And uh, the chart that's up there right now is we do have, we're attaching a link to a PDF in the chat area uh, where we have listed um, links for some of the information that we have today on the questions that you've answered. And for people that have iPads or ta tablets, the link to the PDF can be opened and you can download the PDF. Okay, next, let me um, begin by introducing today's panelists, Patty and Penny. Um, Patty learned her love of gardening growing up in Santa Rosa on her Italian grandmother's farm. She has had a lifelong love for nature, planting trees, vegetables, and flowers. Upon retiring from teaching, Patty completed the Master Gardener course in 2018 uh, and learned the science behind sustainable gardening and enjoys spreading word to the community. When not gardening, she likes to hike, read, and travel. Our other panelist today is Penny. She graduated in the Master Gardener class of 2014 and is the content editor for the Master Gardener website. 
She writes two weekly Facebook posts titled On Penny's Farm and Time to Read. COVID, and she says hopefully post-COVID, she frequently is at the Occidental Farmer's Market Master Gardener Help Desk. Outside of Master Gardeners, she is actively involved in fire safety and reduction efforts in Occidental and West County. Okay, let's begin today's questions. And like I said, we'll start with the pre-submitted questions. And remember that you can submit additional questions through the chat feature. Okay, first question. This question is from Alicia. And her question is, what to do when asparagus is coming up in February? Do you mulch? Do you put plastic? Okay, I'll so go who wants and begin with that one. Okay. Um, I suggest that you use mulch because what happens sometimes in February, we get this beautiful weather like we have right now. And then, you know, the asparagus will start to come up and then lo and behold, we're gonna get a frost. And then that's when you need to protect them. And if you put some just light mulch over it, sometimes I'll use just straw to lightly over the spears. Or if you know a frost is coming, you can use some kind of a cover. I wouldn't use plastic, however. And I would be very careful that whatever you put, oh, if you do use something like plastic, that it actually doesn't touch the plant. Penny, anything else? No, I use mulch, but then I don't get a lot of frosts here. Um, row covers would be a good mm -hmm. thing if you, if you know that there's a pretty hard frost coming. Yeah, exactly, exactly. They can sustain a very light frost. But if, it, if we get a heavy one, yeah, it ruins the tips, which is the best part, right? That's the part that we want to eat. Mine are just starting to come up. I just picked a few this morning. So cool. this sunny weather, that's definitely. Yeah, I have to go check mine. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Miriam. And she asks, what were the results of your investigation regarding why there was so much bolting of onions in spring and summer of 2020. Let me take that. Um, we looked at that and a cold snap or the wrong type of onion, the wrong variety um, could, all of, all of those could cause that. There are two types of onions um, the early onions, which are best planted in November and January, and the late onions that can be planted January through March. Um, there's long day and the short day. And the long days need 15 to 16 hours of daylight and the short days are fine with 12 hours. So depending on where you live, it's very important to, part, to plant the right kind of onion and generally that's the problem. Also, a hot spell can cause them to, to bolt. And if they do, the recommendation is to cut the flowers off. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, this crazy weather, sometimes that's what happens with the plants. Yes. You can get a hot spell in January these days. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Stephanie. My purple Japanese honeysuckle has to be in a pot, unfortunately. I bought it from an unattended roadside stand, no notes on what it is. I may not even have identified it correctly. I went by internet images. I don't know how to care for it. Its trunk bark looks like an ancient tree and is peeling. It bloomed the first two years I had it, but has not bloomed much in the past three years, despite remaining in the same spot with the same care. It receives morning to midday light from the east in the early morning, and then from southeast sun 10 to noon. I assume the concrete wall provides heat. Wow, so we have this, uh, this is from our website. So there's some um, information about the Japanese honeysuckle. Um, since it is in a pot, and um, it sounds like it's been in the pot for quite some time, it may need to be repotted. 
or perhaps um, when you fertilize, make sure you're not just fertilizing with a nitrogen fertilizer because sometimes those will cause it to just leaf out but not flower. Anything else, Penny? No, I'm, I have never planted a honeysuckle. So. <laughs> yeah, they can be invasive. So it's very good that you have it in a pot. They I like apologize. It. I think that was from Anne, not Stephanie. <laughs> I'm reading one line down. <laughs> is Anne here today? Yes, yeah. I think she is. She no, it was from Steph. Mm, I don't know. Clarify. Um, I'll ask Anne if, if you, I mean, if you want to unmute, if you have any further clarification you need. Um, Hi. You're <laughs> Hi. 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 You're right. I think it is the, the Lonicera. Um, you know, the peeling bark troubles me. Um, it, it's, it's trunk looks damaged and maybe it's the spot where I'm, where I have it. Um, I tried to, I didn't know how to send you a picture. I thought that might be helpful, but there wasn't an attachment possibility on the email format. Okay, I have, two suggest I have a suggestion for that. First yeah. of all, um, I did have some honeysuckle in my, it wasn't in a pot, but it was in the yard. And the bark, as they get older, the bark does tend to have that kind of peely texture. Ah. So it could be just that, that that's the natural way of it. But the other suggestion is send your picture to the Master Gardener help desk. Okay. They will get back to you. They're really good about that. They check the, um, the email. Um, and they're, and you can do it also by phone, but then you can't send a picture. Um, and they're really good. They'll get back to you within a few days. Oh, thank you so much. I'll do that. Thanks for everything. Uh -huh. Bye. Well, thank <laughs> Bye. Thanks sure. for submitting the question. You bet. All right. Are we good? The next question is from Lorena, who I think is also here today. Uh, is how to remove gophers and moles without poison. <laughs> That's always a popular one. <laughs> yeah. That is one of my favorite. We're all smiling. I about can't them. say favorite. Um, I use traps. Some people don't like that, but there aren't a lot of alternatives. I mean, you don't, I'm, I'm not a poison person because I have pets and we have birds and I just don't think it's a good idea environmentally um so that kind of leaves you with traps or doing nothing there is a doing nothing that you can use and that is to put in barn houses for the um bar owl houses for the barn owls um i can't do that on my property because i have too many trees on surrounding properties. I have a few tall redwoods on my own, but most of them are on the borders. But I checked with the Bird Rescue Society and they said it wouldn't work because of the great horned owls that live in the tall trees attack the barn owls. And the barn owls are smart enough to know so they don't live any place where there's a lot of tall trees. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, trapping, I have this little display here. I like trap line traps because I have old hands and these are, I find, I've tried every kind out there. These are the easiest to set. I don't know if you can see those or not, but they're small. They're really easy to set. They come in three sizes and I'll explain that. This is the gopher size. And it's in theory size to put into a gopher hole. And then there is the smallest is a mole hole size and the middle one is called a large mole size. Well, I have hard play. And what I find is that the tunnels are in fact smaller than advertised. And that um, for me, many of the smaller tunnels, the mole or the large mole works a lot better and it works is just as efficient at killing gophers as long as they're not huge guys. Um, the big thing with using traps is that you need to dig back to the main tunnel. Sometimes that takes a little digging, but it's usually not too far from the hole that you've seen that they've 
erupted from. Um, so just dig carefully. Sometimes it's really frustrating. Sometimes it's hard to find the tunnel entrances into the hole, but they're there. I'm laughing hey, because we're all frustrated with this problem. Oh. We all have the gopher problem. I do have an owl box and it has been very, very helpful. So if you're in a, in a place where you can have an owl box, it's not only good for your gophers, but it's great to watch them at dawn and dusk um, go in and out of the box and with their little shrieky noises and chirping noises. And they're just extremely fun. The other thing, um, there's a new um, gopher trap out called um, the gopher hawk, which my husband loves because it's, you don't have to dig a hole. You just poke it in. And when you feel the hole, then you, you push it down right there. And um, he's been very successful with that. But we've got lots of different traps, believe me. It's persistence because those gophers do not give up and there's a lot of them. So I really, really feel for you. Hey, panelists, we, we did have a, a comment from Lorena. She mentioned that she's concerned about some of the traps because she has a puppy that likes to dig um, and so is worried about the puppy. Yeah, I, I have two dogs I, and one of them is small and, and digs constantly. I put the traps way back and I cover the hole with, with a bucket with stuff in it or something after I've put the traps in and the dogs can't move what I've moved, put it uh, over it. We do the same thing. Okay. And do you put your traps on wires or nylon cord or something because sometimes something will go after that gopher like a fox and dig it out. And in that case, they'll take the trap as well if you don't have it stapled down and tied to a piece of wire. Pat, this is Cleo. Can I take a moment to go over the UC integrated pest management page? Sure, and sounds all you good. have to do in it, whenever we talk about pests, we try to refer you to the integrated pest management uh, program of the state of California. So if you Google UC IPM, and this is where you will land, but make sure you go to where it says home, garden, turf, and landscape pests, because the other sections are for farmers, ranchers, and um, not regular homeowners. So here you will find, for example, for the uh, gophers, you will find under here what's called a pest note. And the pest note, um, it's under pocket gophers. Come on, Cleo, you know where it is. I was just there, hold on, pocket gophers. Uh, and the pest note, you could download it as a PDF. And what they do is they give you, they identify it, which is the critical thing first is to identify the pest, then figure out what kind of damage it causes, make sure that it's a gopher, uh, what the legal status is, and then the management. And what they usually probably tell you is the least, uh, how would you say it, uh, Penny? You're, you're good at it. The least Most toxic, environmental. The least, uh, intrusive method. And you, they start with, uh, for example, with this pest with exclusion, probing for the burrow, burrows, trapping, natural ways, and then they go into if you're going to use any kind of uh, chemical or such. So you think of it as a hierarchy to use the least chemical and the least intrusive way. So UCIPM well, is your friend. <laughs> it's fantastic for all pests. Not just yes. Yet. Okay, we're ready for the next question then. Here we go. <laughs> this is from Pamela. Uh, she says, I've been trying to practice no-till and I add a layer of a couple of inches of compost to the top of my bed each season. I've noticed a huge spike in cutworms and millipedes now. Am I doing something wrong what can I do organically to help eliminate these pests? I love no-till, so um, I'll start. Um, you're not doing anything wrong. No-till is the best way you can possibly garden and you'll be very successful. 
Um, the first thing you want to be sure is that you really have cutworms. If you look here, you can see um, an example of what they look like. And, you know, there's lots of different worms in our soil. So um, it's really, you have to be really careful to find exactly um, what you're looking at. And then um, the other thing is that the millipedes are not dangerous. Uh, they don't bother anything in your garden. They're just there. If they come in your house, maybe then it would be a problem because you just don't want those critters in your house. But in the garden, they're not hurting anything. And as far as the cutworms, your best bet is to go out in the evening with a flashlight and just pick some and get rid of them. My chickens love them. Um, and usually cutworms are only a problem in the spring. So um, the other suggestion would be maybe when you first put your, your new plants out is to put a, maybe a, protect your seedlings with a cardboard collar of some sort to keep the worms from getting on them or wait and start your, your small plants when they're a little bit bigger. That's another um, alternative. Um, Penny, any other thoughts on this one? No, I don't know that row covers keep out cutworms. Not a row cover, but, but when I looked it up on the pest notes, they suggested a cardboard collar. Yes. To keep them from um, crawling yeah. on, onto the plant. And because what the, the cutworm will actually do if the seedling is really small, they'll just bite the, the stalk or the stem of the little seedling right off and you it'll be gone. It, sometimes it, you think it's a snail. Um, that's got it, but it can be the cutworm. So yeah, <laughs> another one of the many, <laughs> many springtime uh, problems. Birds too, be careful because um, that's why I said be sure it really is a cutworm. So I go out, yeah. at, out at night with a flashlight to look because birds at this time of year love little tiny seedlings. They go- Which is why you want the row covers. Yeah, yeah. That, that would- be a good one for, for protecting it from birds. Okay. Is that person here Thank today, maybe they have more questions. I don't think so. I, I didn't, I don't think so, but I could be wrong. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, next question we have is from Cassie and asks, what type of plants would you grow that provide aromatherapy, aromatherapy attributes as well as medicinal benefits. Cassie, I'm sorry, but we are not trained to provide advice on medicinal or nutritional qualities of plants. So we actually can't answer your question, but I'm quite sure you can Google it and find your answer. Okay. Do you have anything to add to that, Patty? No, it's just very difficult with medicinal plants. Everybody has a different idea. So um, our UC program has decided that not to train us in that particular aspect. So we really don't have any information for you. I'm sorry. Okay. Next question is from Lisa. Uh, she asks for suggested native plants, low growing shrubs or ground cover to grow under oak tree canopy um, this is a three-parter. Then she has the best multi-purpose liquid fertilizer and tips for successfully growing Meyer dwarf lemon tree in a pot. Wow. Well, <laughs> should we start with the oak? Because we have this, the page up. Um, Cleo, maybe you could walk her through. Is this person here today? Uh, I didn't see her, but let me take a look again. Okay, because um, this is a great page for planting under the oaks. Um, and I'm not sure, is it under the article section, gardening articles? Um, let me go through this. If you go to our webpage, on the, uh, let, let's say you, you land on our webpage, we have a wonderful new section on California natives. And in this section here, it has a section on planting under oaks. There All this go. information on our natives on our webpage has just been updated by a diligent team that has updated all the information on all the plants. And if you go here to where it says planting under oaks, it gives you the uh, 
what are the suggested plants and if they are vines, if they're uh, ground covers and perennials. You could also check with the other sites that we refer you to, the California uh, Native Plant Exchange. They also have here all the, uh, and the Cal Flora uh, webpage. Great, it's a, it's a great article here um, to answer this and question. We will have the links in the PDF that, uh, to the uh, PDF, it's in the chat area. If you download all the links that we are giving you will be in that PDF. But basically for growing under oaks, um, the best thing is to use something that you would see um, in the wild under an oak. And that list there is perfect. Yeah, that avoids a lot of problems with um, the wrong kind of dryness or wetness or um, to the right sunshine exposure or pests or weeds. The critical thing is to not plant anything that needs watering in the summer. Yes. Okay, and what was the next question? I'm the next ask. one is the best multi-purpose liquid fertilizer. Well, we suggest compost as your absolutely best fertilizer, but if you want to use a liquid fertilizer, I suggest fish emulsion. Yes. That's exactly what I use for both things, both cases. Okay. The third part of that question was tips for successfully growing Meyer dwarf lemon tree in a pot. All right, here we go. Here's our page on that. Um, I do have a lemon in, in a pot because um, I get pretty heavy frost here. And they are heavy feeders. I suggest feeding them three or four times a year. I believe it's like every six weeks. And um, I know one of our food gardeners suggested on the holidays, I wrote this down, let's see. She said she starts April 1st, then Memorial Day, then July 4th, and then Labor Day. And make sure that you fertilize with a high, you know, an acid fertilizer for lemons or cit for lit citrus or avocados. Yeah, buy a citrus fertilizer. Mm -hmm. The other thing, Important. be careful in a pot that you don't overwater because they do not like to have wet feet. Anything else, Penny, you can add? No, I'm, all my citrus are in the ground because we don't get um, yeah, lucky. frost, so I'm lucky. Uh, actually, one of the, the, the uh, is uh, less fertilizer for container level. Container. Yes. So that's good to know, too. All right. All right. The next question is from Dana. I don't think she's on, so I'm open. Uh, she, we could have used some clarification, but she wants to know about affordable lawn replacement. Mm. I wish she was here because we have yeah. a lot of program. So called, you're not, you're not under an alias, do. Dana, are you? <laughs> no. It's a lot depends on whether you want a walkable ground cover or, or not. But we have some really good lists in our um, on online on our per, in our website. Well, for anybody who's ready to replace their lawn, this Garden Sense program is fantastic. They will help you decide on um, which plants um, you can plant to be water safe and um, which ones will grow well in your particular microclimate um, and everything. The, uh, if, and if the question is about getting rid of a lawn, your best bet is sheet mulching. Um, here's the brochure from the uh... And it, the, the link is also there. It's on our webpage as well with the, with the plants that are recommended to replace and ground covers and such. And maybe, uh, yeah, it, the ground covers and the various things that you can use to replace. I have a large section of Daimondia, which I do walk on. It's not, I don't have kids playing on it or anything like that, but I walk on it. The dogs walk on it. Um, it works well for me. Yeah, the, is, but that person isn't here today. It's too bad because I would like to ask some follow-up questions. Yes. 
So Dana, if you watch the uh, video later, <laughs> contact us. <laughs> um, okay. We'll contact Garden Sense and have them yeah. give you a good advice. Yeah, that was a great uh, photo of that. Yeah, here's a really good link of what Diamandia looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good alternative. Takes and very little water. water. Yes, we really have to be thinking about those drought, drought tolerant plants now because the way the situation is going, even if we get rain this year, in the future, there's going to be less and less rain in California. So we really need to focus on, um, you know, yeah. limiting no, our lawn just... and growing natives and plants that are drought tolerant. Yeah, for my property, it's a very scary problem. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, there's a lot of wonderful California natives that we can plant. Yes. Okay, moving on. Uh, this question's from Lydia. How much sun do herbs need? Ooh, we have a great webpage on that. And it depends on the herb, obviously. It depends on the herb, very that. much so. And there's also a web page that shows the um, amount of sun each. Did I write that down? No, I'm sorry. E each kind of herb needs, yes, exactly. Yeah, that's great. Um, ba basically, the um, annuals, some annuals, well, no, it's, it's just all over the place. Basil is an annual that needs lots of sun, um, chives. Not, well, they're not an annual, but it, you have to look at the individual herb. This particular page is from actually from the, the uh, Sacramento Master Gardeners, but it's very yeah. helpful. It's a really good page. But most herbs do require um, quite a bit of sun, I would say. Most herbs come from Mediterranean climates and they require fairly yeah, good sun and not too much water. And there's a lot of different herbs and um, yeah, they're great to have in the garden. Some you can grow year round. Most are, um, a lot of them are annuals, but there are some that you can grow year round. Oh yeah. Some of the more tender annuals like dill and uh, parsley will tend to molt if they're in too much sun in the summer. So you need to start picking them, you know, taking the flowers off. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And cilantro is notorious. Uh, yes, I have a hard time with cilantro. <laughs> basil, you want to keep the flowers off all the time too. Yeah. Well, the more you pinch basil, the more basil you get. So I think they also suggest sometimes that you do rotated planting so that those that are possibly going to bolt early or whatever, you have another crop coming up. Yeah. Doesn't work too well for cilantro. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to bolt at the same time, no matter what. I agree. I think, I think sometimes the seed sprouts and it bolts. <laughs> uh, yeah, I always wondered if you could get, at the same time, you could get cilantro and mint so that you could have your margaritas and your salsa. <laughs> well, it always doesn't make any sense to me that tomato season and cilantro season do not coincide. <laughs> But basil and tomatoes go. Basil yeah. and tomatoes, yeah. The Italians go, are, have it made. Yeah. Okay, are we ready? Uh -huh. um, the next question is from Eileen, and I believe that she's here, so we may ask her to elaborate in a minute. Her question is what to plant and when? And I didn't know if you wanted to show her some pages that has some timetables, and then if she wants further clarification, she can unmute herself and, and ask us. And is it vegetables or not vegetables? Hello, it's Marlena here. Um, yeah, it's um, veggies. And last year, I'm a bit of a novice at this. I mean, I'm, I, I must say I'm very impressed with all these um, questions that have been um, dealt with so far. I mean, they, they, this is that's all at a much more advanced level than the kind of gardening that I'm doing. Last year in April, I planted um, the 
the the eight foot by four foot Sonoma summer veggie garden um, that's on your website um, that has a sort of mixture of tomatoes and cucumbers and basil and some flowers and things and it worked quite well um, I did find it was a little all a little bit cramped um, for some of them but that worked quite well and I wondered whether you have something like that again and when would be the right time to actually start planting that summer garden again um, is it too early now? And I, I live in the town of Sonoma, in the valley, and um, so and our, you know, our veggie garden is in boxes, and it's and they're reasonably, it's reasonably sunny, sunny. I would suggest you look at our chart and see which vegetables you want. Um, Marlena, we have this chart on our webpage, and for each. Yeah, vegetable. I've seen the chart I was looking for something a bit more um you know this is very much by type of plant I was wondering you know I'm going to try I'm going to plant that Sonoma eight by four summer garden again and I'll just space things out but I wondered if you have you know the other thing I'm really interested to try is the three sisters planting I tried that last year and it didn't really work because the beans just took over and knocked over the corn and and so it was a little bit of a mess but you know something that's more like how can you plan a veggie garden so things work well together yeah you have a good question i i just want to congratulate you on on starting your garden that's just so encouraging to hear um Thank it you. sounds like you have a small space so um the three sisters takes up a lot of space so if you're gardening in a small in a container like that you might want to head to something a little more compact because that those three things get huge um as to your question i would suggest most of the crops that it sounds like you're going to want to grow would go into the ground around April 15th because that's our last frost date. And for okay. most of our summer annual growing things, that's when you would, would plant those things. Okay. Uh, did you, Marlene, did you use the square foot gardening plans? Um, no. Okay. No, I, didn't, I didn't do that one. Um, I chose the one, it's from your website. And mm -hmm. I think it was just called the Sonoma. Hang on. Let me see if I can find the... Um... Cleo, go, go to the garden. That's where I'm at. I'm at the uh, food garden... Food, food gardening articles. Yeah. It's called a four foot, four by eight foot vegetable bed uh, layout. Uh, so hang on, I'm just going to put my camera on I'll, and I'll um, show you. Stephanie Wrightson is here. Stephanie, can you tell us where this... It looks are? like this. So if you look under the summer, the spring and summer garden, uh, okay. You see that this says sample vegetable bed. I think that's the one right. she's referring to. Yeah. Right uh, to the left of the am table. I on the right page? You here? know, go down. Right. Yes, you're on the right yes. page. Go down and then see. Oh, up. Uh, up. All right. So look for the picture. Go up. 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 See. Okay. Those, uh, see where the tomatoes are bed. right there. In yes. Spring and summer. So, okay. So there's the sample vegetable bed. See, we have so oh, much. Oh, no, that's on our a new one. That's okay. a new one. That's different. I was. There was one in the paragraph one. above too. Yeah, this so one. The, has, I'm sorry. I, I'll let Stephanie because she's one of the food gardening specialists, so she could answer it. Well, Penny is too. Oh, okay. But, um, <laughs> more so than me with her farm, and compared to my community garden. But this is a plan that we have prepared, and the page two actually has um, suggestions for certain varieties, etc., and harvesting that do well in Sonoma County. We also so have a summer vegetable uh, four by eight foot bed plan that was developed for our gardening with less water, food gardening with less water. Yeah. And I don't believe we have that on this particular page. It is on yeah, our, there you go. That's the one I there used. It is. Yeah, okay. That now, was can, I, can I ask a question about this? Do you see, um, I'm sorry, these are really basic questions. Everybody. That's, that's so why probably, we're here probably dead boring for all you no, 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 no. No. But no. Okay, you see where it's got lettuce it's got 
uh, one, two, three. It's got oh. a dozen lettuce plants there. Is it meant to fit a dozen in there, or is that just for illustration? Because I found that it's planted, partly for illustration. It, it really exactly depends on what planted. variety of plant you. If you're planting large romaine heads, you will not get that many lettuce in there. If you're planting, um, you're if you're growing baby leaf lettuce uh, or something like uh, a small romaine, like spotted. Uh, what is that spotted trout? St Ooh, spotted yeah, no trout back. I think it's called, it's one of my favorites right now. I can't recall it, but it's a smaller kind of leaf lettuce type romaine. I could fit that many in that space, yeah, but so. I couldn't if I was growing a larger romaine with a big head like uh, Paris Island or something like that. Okay. What I was quite surprised about was how nicely the cucumbers grew. I've always been a bit scared of growing cucumbers because they seem to be so like fiddly, but they were fantastic. The cucumbers, we had, oh. we had hundreds of them and they were, and I've got those wire teepee things uh -huh. and, and they were, they were really brilliant. So I'm feeling very excited about planting cucumbers again. What variety but thank you. The, the, the spring the veggie garden that you showed me just now, that looks like the thing that I can start planning now. Um, yes, the definitely. The, you could do that now. So uh, yeah. the, the spring to summer, uh, you need to be careful right now. Obviously, you could plant some uh, lettuce in our in our warm weather vegetable bed. We often have some cool weather crops that can transition into summer. Um, and so I, I, I'm in Sonoma Valley too, but I'm at the opposite end of from where you are. And we have had some frosts, although I'm not sure we're going to have any frosts this year, but we've had some frosts as late as May 1st since yeah. I've lived here. So yeah. you really do, we talk about an av last um, average frost date for Sonoma County and we use April 15th, but we need to be very cognizant of our microclimates as well as our current weather predictions. So it's just being aware of that. Use, uh, use April 15th as your guide for maybe seeding things indoors now to put out later. And then as you get close to April 15th, take a look at the local weather predictions for the next couple of weeks to make sure it's safe, or you'll need to plan to provide some protection. Yeah, great. But you can can I ask one another thing, and that is, you know, where to buy these, um, what I call seedlings, and I think you call starts. Oh, <laughs> um, I, I have just been going to Friedman's and I just look at the varieties they have and I buy those. I mean, can I assume that those are probably the best ones to buy for Sonoma or is there a better idea that I, you could give me? Well, we're not allowed to recommend any particular places, but there are lots of like um, associations that in the spring have sales. So if you watch the newspaper, you will see um, many of the, the local community gardens to support themselves will offer sales and they all, you know, are seedlings, organic seedlings that they grow themselves and therefore our climate here. Okay. So we've got the Sonoma Ecology Center just down the road from us. So uh, somewhere like that. Yeah. yeah, somewhere like that. And there will be a number of different places that you will see um, come like around April 1st, you'll start seeing them all the way into May to get tomatoes, peppers, um, all your summer vegetables. But just on an aside, as you can see here, like the beets and the carrots, the radishes, all that kind of stuff you could plant now because those are, are fairly frost tolerant. Okay. And some you can plant okay. from seed. Yeah, carrots you should always plant from yeah. seed. Yeah. Yeah. No, that I did know. Super. Thank you all so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Radishes are um, very satisfying because you, you put the seeds in and in two, three weeks you have radishes. Is yeah. that am I right? Yeah. Beets grow very well from seed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just get some uh, radish seeds and just start putting them in different pots in different places and parsley seeds too. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted, I didn't want to leave out Eileen because she had the question of what to plant and when, and I think that she's here today. And if, if we answered her questions with the veggies or if she was looking at knowing when to, what else to plant, 
when. So if Eileen, if you're there and want to unmute, if we haven't covered what you wanted to know. Um, that, that, well, the uh, websites are pretty good. And I have a eight foot by 24 foot garden plot. So um, it's, it's pretty big. And so vegetables and uh, flowers. Mm -hmm. I guess I can look at your sites and find out what I need. <laughs> You know, it's really, you have to plant what you like to eat and what you like to look at. So <laughs> that's yeah, what I, I do check our list of companion plant flowers because those will help you with the insects as well as okay, provide good. Good. flowers for your garden too. And you remember the world only needs one zucchini plant and one I cherry know. tomato plant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, I did want to mention, and I'm looking into the chat on questions, and I know that uh, Miriam had come on a little later after we addressed her question, and I think she was provided a link. She had the question about the bolting of onions, and if, you know, you can look at the link, plus if you go back to the second question in this recording under YouTube, uh, that was when we answered that question. <laughs> so. Um, we also had some additional questions in the chat, which I know there was some conversations going on on some of these. Um, and I want to get to the top here. So I think, um, <laughs> silly, <laughs> you've been uh, uh, texting, I know, with Eartha here in the chat about you had a question about how I can tell when the bark starts slipping as a time to do bark grafting, when to leave nurse branches on a tree when grafting. Uh, I don't know if your question got answered completely in the chat or. Um, I suggest contact the rare fruit growers, but yes. um, they are fantastic. They, they even have, I believe, um, some videos on grafting. Yes, and they have classes too in normal, normal times. They're really, really good. Yeah. And you can ask any question on their mailing list. It's a Redwood Empire a branch of the California Rare Fruit Growers Association. Okay. Another source that's really important if you're into uh, like IPM and other sources is the California Backyard Orchard. And that's another site that is provided by the University of California and it has all the issues that you have about growing trees and they have a very detailed section on grafting. Uh, we will try to have at some point some specialist master gardeners who will focus on certain areas when we do the master gardener. So keep an eye for that. Okay. Um, we, have, we have a question on aphids that didn't get answered. Yeah, I'm working my way down because there was, yeah, there has been a couple on aphids um, about the uh, spray solution that won't harm animals or p other animals or humans or plants. I use insecticidal soap. Yeah. Or just plain water. Water, uh, a, a kind of a strong jet of water if you get one of those nozzles that makes that kind of really yeah jet. Um, <laughs> um i was out there this morning uh, on the spigarillo doing it because the little aphids were trying to take over and i was like <laughs> that it's tough in the spring they just go nuts um for those little tender plants so you have to be diligent every couple days go check your plant yeah and they go after the brassicas big time in your vegetable garden and you don't want to spray that with anything but water but you have to do it frequently yeah yeah they're one of the most common pe pests to be honest um i did see in the garden as well though some ladybugs so i'm hoping that they're <laughs> they're coming out of hibernation and they're going to attack those horrible little aphids <laughs> Yep. I look at my aphids as a, 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 a buffet for um, beneficials. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good way to look at it. I like your positive attitude. Yes. 
as I'm swearing as I'm spraying my uh, broccoli and Brussels sprouts and everything. I only wish that they were more beneficial insects because they don't make a dent in my aphids. Yeah, oh, especially the, uh, uh, the, the milkweed gets really attacked by aphids. Really? Yeah, but you know what? The ladybugs always end up winning on mine. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I do, I'm just patient to leave it. And, yeah. and those are usually the oleander aphids, which are yeah. a little tougher aphid. They're those yellowish orange. Yeah. And, uh, and eventually they're hard to wash off, but you know, I've actually taken my hand sometimes and just run it up the uh, leaf. You go kind of orange afterwards, but hey. <laughs> it always amazes me how many colors aphids come in. Yep. <laughs> But I think those are some of the tougher aphids I've seen. <laughs> Actually, today we had uh, uh, we posted on our webpage that UC um, Entomological Museum is going to have a talk on the the life of the aphid. Um, it's uh, quite an amazing <laughs> a scientist is going to give a talk on the one aphid life. Boy. I wonder if he's going to talk about how you can uh, dissuade them from coming to your garden. She, 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 it's, it looks really fun. Uh, I'll put the link up here if anybody is interested. Um, Look at all those different types. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think, you know, as far as I can tell, looking through the chat area, I think either through, um, uh, I know, some of our researchers answering back in that. And I think most of the questions have been answered. Um, okay, does anyone else that's here have more questions? Or if we didn't answer the question that you put there and I'm, I'm misreading, let us know. <laughs> Just put something in again. <laughs> yes, please. My name is Maria. Uh, how, how often can you plant tomatoes in the same uh, raised bed, how many years? That's an interesting question. If you talk to the tomato guy, what's his name? Brad, what was it? Brad Gates? Is that the tomato guy? I forget his name now. But anyway, he says that you can plant them over and over in the same raised bed if you use lots of compost and, and amending your soil. Okay, number two, can you plant a tomato in a container and how big it should, the container should be? Yes, you can definitely yes. have one in a container. The bigger, the more, the bigger it'll grow. So I suggest um, the biggest container you possibly could put it in, like a wine barrel or something like that would be really mm -hmm. um, plenty big enough for it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if you're gonna go into a little pot, yeah, it probably won't produce very many tomatoes. My neighbor had great success last year with the larger of the black potting things that you get from the nursery, the tree, the tree size. Um, she was selling them on a fruit, the, the fruit on her fruit stand. So she did pretty well. She was really happy with them. Yeah, those are pretty big too. And I think there's certain variety of, of tomatoes, like some of the little cherries would probably grow better in a container as opposed to like some of the bigger beef steaky ones. Mm -hmm. I want the last question, please. I have these raised beds now, different sizes, eight by four, four by six, and four by four. And I haven't uh, done anything to it in the fall. And right now before starting plant seeds as well as seedlings, what should I do? How can I best amend my soil right now? I know compost, compost, compost but how compost. much actually, how much compost to on the top of how many inches of a compost uh, on the top of a raised bed? We normally recommend two inches in the fall and two inches in the spring. Since you didn't put any on in the fall, I'd go a little bit more than two inches, as much as four if you can. That's, I agree. I think that'll be really great. I think you'll be- Okay, then you just put that on the top of it. Do you work it into the soil? No. Or does it... You don't need to. Just leave it on top. Okay, and then when you do that, if it's four inches, that's quite a bit. So if you put your, then you put your seedlings in it too, right? Then it mm -hmm. goes into the compost. Yeah. 
But when you put your seedling in, then you would kind of dig that right where the seedling goes. You would dig yeah. it in a little bit. Oh, I see. Dig so a hole anyway. Okay, so we don't. Should I water it to make the compost ju ju <laughs> juices, nutrients go into the soil? Yes. yes, you will have to at some point, probably. Probably drip irrigation would work fine. But to start, if the compost is kind of dry, mm -hmm. um, I would definitely water. If yes. the compost is moist, um, you'll well, probably be okay. Uh -huh. And do you have any places that you can uh, buy it in bulk? I used to have I used to have uh, access to horses, but not anymore. So, uh, so I have to get mm -hmm. some from uh, uh, all our lands. There's lots of landscape companies in the area, and they all um, have yeah. uh, compost that you can buy in bulk by the yard. So they'll even deliver if yeah. okay. Yeah. There's you one in West Marin that makes very good compost yeah. that delivers. So, uh, the I think you need to be careful that it needs to be compost that is uh, treated, not the just raw horse manure or other manure. It needs to be uh, compost that was heated and... Or oh, heated, yes. Not treated, but heated. Heated, yes. yeah. So yeah. you need to make sure that you're not just putting... If you put just straight manure, that's different. You need to wait a yeah. month and you need to be careful in planting any root vegetables. Yeah, no, I would, no, I would just go, I, I'm organic, so it would be an, go to a company and just ask for organic uh, compost, yes. Mm -hmm. Organic compost, and I assume once, if they're selling it, it has been heated probably, right? Yeah. Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Most of them are produced with the self-heating from the fermentation. Okay. Thank you very much for the questions, answers, and the program. Thank you. Please come back. Oh. Of course. <laughs> I'm already signed up for the next Zoom. <laughs> Excellent. I'm not sure uh -oh. we have the sign up on the website yet. Yeah. So we have that. We'll, we'll make sure we get it up there. Well, in fact, when somebody gives me a date, I'll make sure. March 24th. March 24th. I mean, okay. I didn't sign up correct, but it's on my calendar to sign up. <laughs> we'll <laughs> go you. over that at, in the, at the end. And also, I saw another question, but it kind of got answered, I think. Uh, Carol was asking, uh, is there an apricot that will grow in West County and produce? Oh, yes. I have one. Hang on. I'll have to go look and tell you what it is, though. I, th I think, Roger, it was at the Patterson Tilton Apache. Are those apricots? I'm not familiar with those particular ones, but I need one of those as well. I have one that produces nothing. <laughs> no, mine, mine's really good. Uh, um, it always tends to rain when they go into bloom because a lot of the um, apricot varieties end up blooming too soon. And then we get a rain or a frost and the blossoms mm. are either knocked off yeah. or frozen off and yeah. Okay, apricot. Uh, Florigold Florigold is the apricot. It's a 400 hour ch um, chill hour. I have to go with very low chill hours because we don't get frosts. And that one works for me very well. When does Florigold uh, blossom? It already has. Oh, so it's early because it seems like if you can get the ones that blossom the latest, those are the ones that will do the best in our area. The later they blossom, the better they'll, they tend to do. They're, they're not really, apricots are difficult in our climate. Um, yeah, particularly mine because of the chill factor. Yeah. But, um, and the fact but I'm very happy with the flower early. gold. They're so good though. Okay, I think that that's all we've got in the chat area right now. All righty. Anything else anybody wants to put in the chat area, feel free. <laughs> Those burning questions you have, now's the time. <laughs> or if you want to unmute and ask us directly. 
Yes. And before you leave, don't forget to save the chat if you're on a computer. And can I say something? It says, look for veggie happenings every fourth Wednesday. It's actually every second Tuesday. I'm sorry, I got that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we have, yeah we, can, um, yeah, we have March and April up now, which you mentioned on the website. Yeah. So you can sign up for both of them. And we hope you will join us. I'm one of the persons who manages the site um, for the veggie happenings. And like I said, I think we said that, yeah, they asked the Master Gardeners every fourth Wednesday. So that means that the next one will be scheduled for March the 24th. Okay. And, you know, by the way, all of our Zoom webinar talks can be found, uh, a list of them on our homepage. And also know that, you know, if, if you, you know, as soon as we finish, you've thought of a question, you know, you can always go to our website and submit, submit your question to our uh, information desk and they'll get back to you uh, with that. So um, is there anything else we want to talk about any topics or are we ready to wrap up for today? I know yeah, it's well, beautiful out there. It might be time to go out and do some gardening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so nice out there. <laughs> Happy plantings. <laughs> yeah. Um, I will say, you know, uh, that like I mentioned to, to by all means, as you know, there seems to be, there's a lot out there on the, our website. Um, in fact, uh, if you, well, if you go to the next chart or whatever, if you, happen to have a phone, you can scan the QR code there. It'll take you to our uh, website. And, you know, there's everything from, you know, firewise gardening to waterwise use. And, you know, you can sign up with the Garden Sense program. Um, and I mentioned that there's listings of upcoming events. So, so please, by all means, go out and explore our website. And in addition, you can also find us on Facebook, um, Instagram, and out on YouTube under Sonoma County Master Gardeners, you'll find a recording of this plus our other programs that we have done. So um, I want to thank you so much for attending today's session of Ask a Master Gardener. And I know all of us are very, very much looking forward to hopefully in the not too distant future where we'll be able to actually, you know, meet you face to face and uh, at the farmers markets and everything again and, and be able to answer your questions. So, um, so take care and hopefully you'll be joining us again soon. Thanks. And he has a comment. Thank you. Sure. And quick comment on the website, the March 24th date isn't there yet, but it will be tomorrow, I hope. Okay. All right.